Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our February 27th Select Board meeting. I call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. If everyone could join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Just in time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to lead the pledge. <laughs> <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will start the meeting with public comment. Per the select board policy, public comment is not a discussion, debate, or dialogue between citizens and the select board. It is a citizen's opportunity to express his or her opinion on issues of town business. The board may respond to a public comment by taking it under consideration when deliberating on an agenda item or referring to the item to the, or referring the item to the administration for appropriate action or response. Public comment shall be for a period of up to 15 minutes, with speakers being allowed three minutes to present their material. Is anyone here for public comment? All right, then we will move on to governmental reports, and we have our local dele delegation here from the state. We have Senator um, Bruce Tarr, Senator Barry Feingold, Representative um, Trom Wynn, and Representative Adrian Ramos. If you guys would like to join us, we'd appreciate it. I'm going to join the board. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. If you want to do that. Which one did you start? Oh, actually, I'll try to show you something. Okay. It appears that I won the coin toss. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're here. <laughs> we're here. Oh, oh nice well, to see you here. too, Dick. Well, uh, Twelve years I've been on this board. It's the first time you've been here on time and ready to go. Oh, Lori, can you make note of that in the official record that I commended tonight for my timely arrival? Dick, it must be because he knows this is the last time he's going to have a chance to be here with you. That's, that, that, that's it. It's, it's all for you, Dick. <laughs> as much time as possible. <laughs> all right. Well, let, let, me, let me get it kicked off. And, and first of all, I just want to say that... Um, we operate as an incredible team as a legislative delegation, and we're very pleased to have the opportunity to represent the town. Uh, we all work together uh, across party lines, across chambers, uh, to be able to work in the best interest of, of North Andover. And the second important thing is that we very much appreciate the relationship we have with you and the partnership that we have with you, not only each member of the select board, but also with Melissa. And we appreciate the level of communication and interaction that we have. Um, on a regular basis to be able to advocate for things that sometimes are routine like chapter 70 and unrestricted general government aid and sometimes that arise out of the middle of nowhere you know, like rain and flooding events but through it all um, we appreciate that partnership and the good communication and, and I do want to take a moment just to acknowledge Melissa's extraordinary work during the flooding events of trying to coordinate relief make sure there was good communication, uh, ensure that people's needs were met to the greatest extent possible, and that is certainly deserving of recognition. On that note, I would signal that we all continue to work on a better system than we currently have uh, with regard to responding to those kind of incidents, and there's legislation currently pending, uh, not only in the governor's budget filing, uh, but also independently. Uh, in legislation that's been filed by legislators, and we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, and we can talk more about that if, if you like. And if you want to risk asking a question, I can give you a very long-winded answer, but I'm not <laughs> going to do that at the moment. But we are here tonight uh, because we are kicking off the season where we come to you and ask for your budget priorities as we deal with the upcoming uh, budgets that we're going to face. The House uh, beginning in April, and the Senate will take up the budget in May. And we come to you at a very different at a very different time than we've come to in the past. Uh, we have been experiencing 
relatively robust tax returns uh, through collect return collections uh, through the time of the pandemic, really, more than we expected. And we've also had uh, very, very generous allocations of funding from the federal government. Unfortunately, both of those things are coming to an end. And uh, we are now in a situation where we have uh, tremendous fiscal constraint. Uh, we're looking at a budget that's going to be very different than the ones that we've been dealing with in the last several years. And we're going to try to continue to maintain our priorities even as the uh, expanse of spending is going to have to contract. Um, I don't personally think uh, that this is a time for alarm. I think it's a time for concern. And so we have to dial back our expectations and, and our aspirations a little bit and make sure that we can fit uh, our priorities into the budgets that we're going to have to deal with. So that being said, um, if you look at uh, the governor's budget proposal, because she goes first uh, in this uh, three-act play, uh, and, and in the first act, uh, you will see that uh, she did propose some very modest increases for your Chapter 70 and for your unrestricted general government aid accounts. I believe um, for Chapter 70, the projected increase is about $133,000, and for UGA, so-called, um, it's in the 70s. I think it's $73,000, $74,000. And those numbers probably don't surprise you. Um, in the last couple of years, we've actually had good growth in North Andover's Chapter 70 accounts, but now that's starting to plateau a little bit. So hopefully we can hold at those levels this year when we have so many challenges. Um, and we can try to, to move on with some other priorities. Uh, that being said, uh, I know that um, the House is already reached out to you about earmarks, and we are the recipients as well, uh, Senator Feingold and I, of your priorities. And I would say to you that as we get into this process, this is the time where collaboration among your legislative delegation is more important than ever, because we have the opportunity to earmark the Senate budget, and our House colleagues have the opportunity to earmark the House budget. Now, in years past, it has been very advantageous when we seek different things in each of those documents because this usually it's been the practice of the budget negotiators to include all of the earmarks that make it into each document. And so if Barry and I advocated for the same things that Trom and Adrian advocated for, then we'd wind up with a set of the same things. But oftentimes when we coordinate, we seek one set of things the House members seek a separate set of things, and when you put them all together in the final budget, it gives you more than you otherwise would have gotten. For the first time in, in last year's budget deliberations, we were warned that that may not be possible going forward. However, um, it still makes sense uh, as a strategy uh, currently as, as we move into this. And so the most important thing is for us to be here with you tonight to talk about uh, what your priorities are, what some of the major challenges are that you're facing. And Melissa did send us a good list. I would, would point out a very succinct list. <laughs> and it also falls in the range of things that I would consider to be very doable. Um, one of the challenges that we face when we reach out to our cities and towns is to say, well, what do you need? And, and we oftentimes hear, well, uh, we need a public safety building for $12 million or, or things of that nature. And we understand that. But those are things that belong more in capital bills, bond bills, than they do in the budget. In the budget, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars usually, and Melissa has sent us that series of, of requests. And, and actually, it was quite modest, and we might even be able to pursue a couple more options, Melissa, as we go forward. So, uh, but I think you, you've left us in good shape in terms of the conversation, knowing that we still have larger things that we're going to need to pursue. I would point out that um, the governor has filed a massive housing bill, a housing bond bill, a fairly substantial information technology bill, uh, as well as a Chapter 90 bill that spans two years, which has always been the goal of the Mass Municipal Association. And here there is a difference in approach. The House has traditionally pursued one year. The Senate from time to time has a dalliance with going two years. Um, I think if I had to predict uh, where we're going to wind up, it's probably going to be one year again. But, um, but we understand the importance of that. And, and it's not insignificant that when we did have some additional money uh, in the last cycle, we did add $100 million um, to the Chapter 90 in separate grants that you all were the recipient of. And, and if those opportunities come again, we'll certainly look to do that. But I think we're probably looking at 
uh, the, the standard uh, one-year Chapter 90 allocation. One thing that I think is significant, and I've got the list here of the earmarks that we were able to uh, achieve in the, in the current budget, is that while many of the earmarks were reduced by half, a number of the North Andover earmarks were not. So um, I wish I could tell you there was some magic dust, and I know if there is magic dust, it's in Melissa's top drawer. But um, a number of the things um, survived, and we're pleased about that. Uh, the one that was reduced was a $25,000 earmark that was basically cut in half. And, and I would say humbly to you, I, I don't believe there's any chance we're going to restore the other half. And rather than spending time and energy on that, we're better off focusing on the future and the new set of priorities and trying to get those things done. Um, last but not least, just to give you a sense of, of what we're up against, and I'm not telling anything you really don't know, but the revenue collections that we've been seeing uh, are dramatically reduced over what we've seen over the last few years. And by that I mean uh, about a month ago, maybe two months ago, uh, the governor, in, in consensus with the House and Senate Ways and Means Committees, reduced the current benchmark for the current fiscal year by one billion dollars. One billion dollars. Even with that, February revenue collections, and we're about you know, halfway through the month, we have mid-month projections, are that we're going to be somewhere between two and three hundred million dollars below the new benchmark. And we don't have that many months left before the end of the fiscal year in June. So we are seeing a dramatic change in our revenue collections. And to drill into that a little bit more specifically, some of our revenue collections are still up, but it's important to understand that the income tax has no rival when it comes to driving the state budget. Approximately 60% of the budget is based on the income tax, and income tax withholding is down, substantially down. And so that's what's causing a lot of our problems. And, and just to, to put on my economics hat for a moment, there had been a hope and I'm going to apologize to my two House colleagues because they heard this spiel from me last night, but there had been a hope that declining interest rates were going to have a number of cascading effects that would boost the economy. So falling interest rates, it was hoped, would trigger new housing starts, increased consumer spending, a little bit more discretionary income as credit card debt was reduced by the falling interest rates. So far that has not happened. We still hope it will. But it hasn't happened. And so when you put all of those things together and you look at the, the national unemployment scope and you look at even what's happening here, we're facing some turbulent economic times. And so that's why this budget is going to be different than prior budgets. But hedged against that is a stabilization fund in Massachusetts that has never been higher. And that's as a result of incredible teamwork that we have a stabilization fund of eight billion dollars. It is historic in its size. And that will be necessary in the case that we do actually get a so-called rainy day to be able to maintain funding for some of the things that we think are important in state government. The other thing that's important is that when we did have excess, we put some of those money in some important trust funds. One for the Student Opportunity Act so that we could continue to fund Chapter 70 at the levels that have been projected. And number two, we put money into a trust fund to be able to pay off some of our unfunded pension liability. And we will draw down on those things. The last account that we have is a transitional escrow account. And it was meant for the very purpose of helping us move from the days when we were getting a lot of federal assistance to the days when that started to ramp down. And that transitional escrow <coughs> account right now has around $800 million in it. Now, the governor has proposed that we use some, if not all, of that to fund the cost of the migrant crisis that we're dealing with. There has been resistance to that in the legislature, but that account also exists. <coughs> so I'm going to leave it there and, and hope that I have not overly monopolized the conversation. And, and Janice, I to see you're taking notes. I hope I didn't, I didn't uh, <laughs> cause you to use too much ink. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues, and I'm going to end <coughs> where I started by saying that we have an incredible partnership in the legislature. I think it's one that serves the, the town well, and, and I know that our partnership with all of you does also. Thank, thank you, Senator. And I also want to echo the great relationship that we have 
uh, with our House colleagues and with Senator Tarr. Um, and I also want to recognize Dick for his years of service. Um, just an amazing leader, amazing friend, and thank you for service the way you've thank served. You. So thank you for that. Um, Senator Tarr definitely covered a lot. I think the things we think about is not only where our revenue is now, but where is it going. And I think there are concerns out there. Uh, I, I'm not in the camp that we're in a recession. I think I'm in the camp that we're in a recalibration. We had so much money pumped in by the federal government that our economy has been on steroids. And now we're coming back to life, and I think we have to learn to live with kind of what we now have. And unlike the federal government, as many of you know, um, we do have to have a balanced budget. We do have a balanced budget amendment. Um, we do have to um, make sure that um, our books, our, our you know revenues equal our expenses. So that is something that we, we will live by. Um, as chair of economic development, uh, the governor spoke today about economic development for the state. Um, that's going to come to the House and then it's going to come to the Senate in front of our committee. And the thing that we really think about is how do we make sure that we remain competitive? How do we make sure that we continue to have you know, sales tax? How do we make sure we have jobs to have income tax? And, and that is something that we have to take serious because we have amazing industry here in the Commonwealth, but everybody else wants that industry too. Everybody wants biotech. Everybody wants clean tech. Everybody wants tech. So we cannot be complacent, and the thing that we're going to really focus on is making sure that we are competitive. One of the things that we are looking at is permitting. I know a lot of you spoke to me about the frustrations some you have when you have all these regulations and things that are in front of you that are, you know you want to bring companies in, but it's very difficult to do that. So we would love to have any thoughts, ideas that you have on the local level. How do we make it easier for you to actually have companies come in here? How do we have it that it makes it that people can come to our town and be successful here? We want it. We want to hear from you on that. And as we always say, there there is no monopoly of ideas. Um, we we are open to and thank you for for. For, for sending those those potential earmarks. Um, we are in a tougher time. We probably won't be able to do as much, but we still have to do some. Um, we always try to protect Chapter 70 and Chapter 90. That is always a priority to us, but we will see how these numbers come. Um, but we, we are committed to making sure that not only we do as much as we can for local aid, but we try to make it as easy on you as well. Um, and as Senator Tyler talked about, I know we've all been through a lot uh, and anything that we continue to do to try to be helpful, provide the resources uh, we want to do. So thank you. Thank you. Um, such a pleasure to be here echoing my colleagues. Uh, it's really such uh, wonderful, it's a wonderful thing that we have this working relationship with you all and I know that the town has benefited greatly from that, whether that's the transportation infrastructure funding that we got or the um, flooding and storms uh, funding that we worked with you all and clearly Melissa and the town, you all were leaders in that effort to try to get some compensation for the flooding and you, you worked as not only a town but a region. And that's the type of relationship that we want to continue to have with you all as we support things like climate change and resiliency and electrification and just all of these measures that will make our town a place where people want to work, live, and raise a family, right? And so um, in terms of the uh, the budget requests, uh, uh, echoing them again, and we just think ditto to everything that they have said. <laughs> uh, but I mean, being this succinct is so helpful, but if you have other pending projects, certainly let us know as well, because it's not just the budget, right? We have other opportunities, other bites at the apple that we want to make sure that we know what you're working on so that when we see these opportunities, we can inform you of them. Uh, and so uh, ongoing conversations like this are, are is so helpful to us and we want to make sure that you know that um, we're there to support the things that you do. And in fact, uh, in terms of other support for uh, local, uh, you know, the local town, uh, to, I'm on the municipalities and regional government uh, committee, and this morning we just had a hearing on a part of the Empowerment Act, which would empower municipalities to have more power in terms of like hybrid meetings and procurement and other um, otherwise. And so, if you have feedback on that, certainly let me know. I can certainly forward that to the committee as we work to um, to empower you all to do what you need to do to support our residents. But thank you so much for the conversation. Okay, well, last but not least, um, I, it is a pleasure to be here, um, you know, as the newest member of the delegation. I think I, I have well and got my feet wet, literally and figuratively, in the last year. 
Um, and so I appreciate the conversation about the budget, but I want to kind of touch on a couple of other things that we are still sort of working on behind the scenes. You know, we um, all saw the devastation that occurred in August and then again in September and the continuing outages. Um, and so we are really um, keeping on top of National Grid. Um, I, in particular, have become a bit of a, um, a, a dog at their heel um, to, to make sure that they're not just looking at preventing these outages from happening, but making sure that they have the crews here in advance of storms, that they are um, you know, following up with the tree trimming and climate plans, uh, resiliency plans. Um, and I also, you know, I'm looking at with, to, to talk with them about when there are outages, what are you doing for our constituents and our residents, particularly those who really don't have the ability to replenish their refrigerator every time there's a storm like that. So, um, so that's something, an effort that we're all kind of keeping an eye on. Um, and I think Janice, uh, Janice is right there in that fight with me um, to the point where I'm now getting text messages ahead of every storm. Okay, we have all these extra crews here in town. So, uh, so that's a, a continued concern I hear from residents um, here in North Andover. Um, and sort of in that same vein, I've been um, working closely or keeping in con close contact with the Office of Dam Safety on the Osgood Dam to make sure that they are really pushing on the owners of that dam to do the repair work necessary um, and likely going to be having a meeting coming up with them to just make sure um, because they had you know kind of flailed in the past despite a poor finding um, uh, that that work is being done uh, to get that, that dam not only from unsafe, which it went from unsafe to poor, and now to get the tree work done and really keep on their heels um, to make sure that that is done in a timely manner because I know it's impacting um, local residents and uh, business owners and quite frankly the safety of that dam. I mean, I think we all stood out there um, with the governor and with Congressman Moulton and saw the damage. Um, and so that is, you know, again, we're, we're kind of working as a delegation to make sure we're keeping up with with these agencies to make sure it's not just, we're not just filing the bills and, and trying to get you money, we're, we're really trying to do that behind the scenes work to keep keep these things moving forward for you. Um, and sort of in that same vein, we've, we've continued to have conversations with the Department of Transportation and Highway Safety around the 114 corridor, which uh, you know I've seen, I think, probably a little bit of an optic of people reaching out to us because now the Merrimack is expanding down the road. We're getting a lot of concerns about that intersection with um, 125 and with the dollar um, store across the way. So. Um, again, I anticipate a meeting coming up again shortly. I'm going to have to be a bit of a, a thorn in their side because they want to keep pushing that off. But all the things that you know, we're working together to, to kind of continue to stay on top of them and make sure we're we're working with you all um, to get some of that, get some of that done, get some better lighting, get an updated um, road audit. So, um, yeah, so that's some of the things we've been working on. Thank you. Uh, open it up to the board for any questions. Um, so uh, we talked about you know, the income tax being the biggest driver of the budget right now, and we're pretty close to full employment, if I'm not mistaken. But why are we expecting to see such a? I don't know, we don't have any economists here, but what are, are you folks being told about what is driving that? Are we losing jobs? Are we losing companies to other states because we can't afford to house workers? What is what's drawing some? I'm leaving the question a little bit, but what's drawing some of that? Do you think? So I, I'm going to put my amateur economist hat on now and, and share that with you. But there are a number of different factors um, that we're seeing that. Um, we still have a lot of jobs that are not going filled. Um, and we hear from employers on a regular basis across the spectrum of employment that they can't find people to work. That started to get better, uh, but it's still a huge problem. There are a lot of people who are underemployed and they're not being able to earn the kind of living that they should be. Uh, we have been experiencing over the last several years a fairly significant outmigration of wage earners. And, and we had this conversation last night in Boxford. A lot of times it's speculated that the folks that are leaving are generally older and, and more wealthy and they're leaving because of the climate in Florida. But the number two state they're going to is New Hampshire. And they're not all older. So one of the most troubling things are the number of people who are leaving that are age 25 to 55. And part of that is exactly something you touched on. The cost of housing is very high. The cost of living in Massachusetts is very high. We remain uh, one of the states with the highest cost of electricity in the entire country. 
So a lot of those things are, are driving folks. Now we did last year have a little bit of an uptick. We started again again. But overall, we're losing wage earners in their very uh, productive years in terms of actual wages earned. We still obviously lose some of the older folks to, for other reasons, um, but we have had an, a loss of wealth, and, and that is a serious issue. And that's why when Senator Feingold talks about the need for competitiveness, that's why we're putting such an emphasis on that, to be able to create more economic opportunity, to be able to retain more people here. A perfect example is that we have a lot of the best institutions of higher learning in the entire country. People are magnetized to come here, but then when they see the cost of living, they go somewhere else. So we have to do better at retaining them. And there is no more um, dramatic symbol of that than housing. We are approximately 200,000 units behind the number of units that we need. And it's a very difficult proposition. And, it, and in my humble opinion, it is not necessarily about funding that housing. It's about citing that housing. And it's very difficult. And so we need to do better. And in my humble opinion, we need to do better at partnering with our municipalities. Because we don't write zoning laws. You all do. And we need to be saying to you more often than we do now, and we are all committed to this, how can we help you? How can we make it easier to cite the housing so that then we can come to the table with the low-income housing tax credit or housing bond bill money or things of that nature, but housing is a huge factor here. And I would just add one other thing, too, is that the reality is interest rates matter. Um, sales tax is down. People are not buying as many cars as they did because it's just more expensive to do that. So that sales tax matters, too. So, and our biggest sales tax item is a car. So we are, we are living with that, and that's reality of high interest rates. And I think to add to all this, too, is that uh, we need to continue to work to catch up with technology. I think one of the biggest problems is that people might want to earn a salary here in Boston but live in the South where things are cheaper. And so how do we keep balancing that? How do we work with companies, with you all, to make Massachusetts more uh, competitive but also more attractive in terms of emphasizing the rights that we have here and other protections like our public school systems and other uh, higher education, for example. And so um, uh, I think it's kind of one of those transitional periods that we're going through right now. Do you see the jobs going to New Hampshire as well or the people living there and working in Massachusetts? Or Well, Representative Wynn pointed out something very important that is a new part of the landscape and that is remote work. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of folks that may be working for Massachusetts companies, but they're not doing it for Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And, and that landscape continues to change. Um, and just to give an example, um, one of the situations that we're finding is vacant commercial space. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the vexing challenges is can we convert that to residential Housing. space? It's a good idea. It, it's not as easy to accomplish in a lot of <laughs> cases as we'd like it to be. Uh, but, I, but I think it's a combination of those things. I think you actually have some people that are physically leaving to, to live and work in other places, but there is a significant component of the population that, since the pandemic, wants to live somewhere else but work for a Massachusetts job. Interesting. Yeah. So, so if I could dovetail a question. Um, I just concluded an affordable housing trust meeting right before this meeting. so. I would be remiss if I didn't ask about this. So the Affordable Homes Act, any update on that? Where, where is that sitting? How's that moving through the, the, the legislation? I, I, think, I think we will do something with affordable housing. I think that is critically important. Um, and that is a, a part of it. Uh, I, I will say that we won't solve our housing problem by, by subsidies. It's a critically important part of it. But you know, if we're 200,000 houses short, on average it costs $600,000 to build a new unit. That's $120 billion, so we, we have to build our way market rate out of this thing, and we have to continue to do stuff on the affordable side, but it has to be both affordable and market rate as well, so we're going to have to do both. And in the housing bond bill, there is money for affordability, mm -hmm. and we want to do that, but we also need to make it easier for development as well. And, and Dick, I, I would just jump in and say that's an area where we'd love to hear from you about some of the challenges you may be facing. Um, in town. So, so for instance, we know that you've done a lot of work with Osgood Landing on both fronts, on, on commercial development and on residential development, and, and in many respects, we can point to this town as an example 
of trying to navigate those things. But if in your deliberations in the future, because we've got a ways to go before we pass that bill, if there are suggestions that you all might have about how we could be helpful both specifically to North Andover and more generally to municipalities, we'd love to hear those suggestions because this is one of the larger bond bills that's ever been proposed on this subject. But it's not just money, it's also policy. So if you all have thoughts for us, we'd love to hear them. And I do just want to go back for a minute when um, Representative Ramos, who's doing an incredible job of, of sort of being very persistent on the roadway safety issue, I recall it wasn't that long ago in this room when you led that effort, um, and, and you deserve recognition for that, um, around the Merrimack College issue. We'd had a strategy, and you began the conversation that led to that first roadway safety audit. You deliver a lot of credit for that, and we're going to continue to stay on Thank it. Thank you, and I actually have to credit my wife for that because she worked in student involvement at Merrimack at the time <coughs> and was the one that actually brought that up, well. brought that to me. So well. it was a family effort. <laughs> but, and, and, a, and, a and a great team one. effort, too, though. And a good one. And yeah. it's ongoing. And, and we will continue to unleash Representative Ramos <laughs> at every opportunity we can on the forces of the Massachusetts Highway Department. <laughs> but... Um, because I had suggested as well as we should be looking at the empty office buildings, but it is awkward because you need bathrooms and kitchens and um, but is it do you think that the need is perhaps smaller units that become more affordable? You know a lot of people um, you know they like studios they like I mean that you might get more people in housing if it's you said six hundred thousand. Well, I hope that our studios are not up to six hundred thousand yeah. now, but uh, I don't, and I don't believe that they are. Yeah. But it just seems to me maybe that some more diverse housing uh, with numbers that kind of can reach out to people who live alone or yeah. retired and don't need the big house. If, if I, if I yeah, please. Sure. Yeah, I, I think absolutely the diversity of, of, of housing stock is important. And one thing that I hear a lot of um, are actually people who are in their big colonials looking to downsize, mm -hmm. but they have <coughs> mobility issues and they can't find a suitable mm -hmm. alternative that doesn't have stairs. Um, and that can meet their needs. And so we're kind of stuck in this situation. And now there are plenty of people who want to age at home, and, and we're happy to support those. But I've, I've had several people reach out and say, I, I'm ready to, to sell. I'm ready to move out of this two-floor home. And, and for me to buy something smaller or that's a ranch or that is a, a first-floor unit, it, it's going to cost as much, if not more, than my current home. So, so we do need to look at, and I think certainly that is something that you know, when we're looking at the bigger picture, creating a diversity of, ty of, of housing stock um, and making sure that we're looking at, you know, this, I mean, we have a large um, baby boomer population that are starting to age out and need, need more care um, and need better housing solutions. And, you know, we have some great um, facilities here in town. In fact, my uncle's at Brightview, um, and that's an, a, a, and he's in the assisted living side, and he has amazing, you know, amazing services there. But he was blessed to have a long-term care policy um, that provides the, co the cost for that. You know, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary expense that many people aren't, don't have the luxury of affording. Um, and that's a, you know, an out unit with elevators and it's, it's got mobility support. And so I think we need to be looking at, at, at doing that, you know, and, and, and all, of, you know, all of those uh, concerns, absolutely. Yeah, and um, to add to that, with the accessory dwelling yeah. units, I mean, that is the, the, um, the housing bill that the legislature is working on. That's certainly a huge part of that is that is one solution to help seniors age in place and to help people with disabilities, et cetera. But, but we do hear from a lot of folks who feel trapped in their current housing situation because they can't find an acceptable replacement, mm -hmm. either because they don't think they can afford it because it's not all on one level, as the representatives were describing. So I think the short answer, Rosemary, is we need housing across the spectrum. We need more multifamily housing. We certainly need some of the smaller units that are affordable, uh, because one of the things that we're hearing about that's also affecting tax revenue is the stagnation in the real estate market. And you probably know better than all of us about that. And one of the things we're hearing about is folks just feel trapped because there's not enough inventory for them to move into, and even if there is, they can't afford it. But the, the prices are definitely mm. still, are still up and they're selling. Yeah. Um, 
one of the right. Yeah. There's no there's no supply, right? There's really not much of a supply, and yeah. and I often will say to people, yeah, we can get you some great money for your house, um, but where are you going? Yeah. I said you could sell your f house, and then now you're looking for a rental that's more than your mortgage used to be. Well, that's what I, that's yeah. And I just tell them you need to be really, really careful. You need a place to go yeah. as a backup because you could find yourself living off the profit of your house, and, that, and then they'll go, oh, okay. Yeah. And they don't, you know, here I am talking them out of it. But I, you got to sleep nights. You know, you can't tell them something that could pose a real problem for a family um, but in the end we can come at it from different angles but it's still a capacity issue and an inventory issue and we have to work together to solve it and, that, and I think that means for towns that sometimes difficult decisions need to be made you know I mean housing developments here I live in town I hear both sides of what happens when new housing developments are proposed big and small I mean, I've heard resistance to the new um, proposal okay. here, which is which is not that that many units compared to other developments here in town. Um, so we have to be be flexible and be be willing to be creative and and push back and say, listen, you know, this might not have a lot of units, but it's got an elevator and it, it is less than than your mom's mortgage. So maybe this is an alternative. And we have to be willing to, to kind of put our necks out in that regard and, and say, yeah, you know what, accessory dwelling units they they are beneficial to our community. Well, and, that, I think that that hits on a, a big point, right? Is, is getting the message home that more housing actually it can be beneficial overall to shared prosperity, right? Because when taking on face value, uh, town meeting or individual residents don't necessarily have the incentive to add more housing, right? Um, and that's I think the biggest challenge that we have to face as a as a region, recognizing that you know the the economic prosperity of the entire region doesn't stop at the borders of North Andover necessarily. So. When, and, and we as a town, I think, over the last several years have done more than any of the surrounding towns, save a few, mm -hmm. in terms of meeting some of that demand, um, whereas you know, maybe some neighboring towns are able to draft off of that. And that's, I, I think it's unfortunate. So it's misaligned priorities in and, some ways. And, and I don't mean to diminish the concerns that are raised, right? Like, I mean, we talk about 114, right? So, so I understand the concerns. I just think we need to be solution-oriented in how we address those concerns rather than just say, these are the things that's going to happen and shut it down. I think we have to be willing to be solution oriented um, when we're looking at that. And I, I think you're right. I think there are some commercial properties in town that are sitting vacant. And I have wondered myself but on, on further down on 114, why aren't we converting these into multi-family housing units? Mm -hmm. You're, you're so. right. Some of them are on, right on 114. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think there's an opportunity there. It's just somebody who's very creative and probably puts two offices together um, not the whole, not the whole big office, but two offices together to put in more like a studio. Yeah. Um, Definitely. And and I think a lot of people would be really happy with their little studio, um, especially if they're they're downsizing and they live alone. Uh, the other big question is they often do want, um, especially you know as you said the baby boomers they really do like a garage so that that's a little trickier to do you've got to have a garage under or something um, because they're older that it's hard for them to get out and get all the snow off and and all things like that but it, the truth is though they do need elevators um, in these office buildings but, but and I they are there for the most part that points up the nature of the partnership right because a lot of those buildings if they were converted to residential are now a non-conforming use and so we have to find a way to incent builders to mm -hmm. make the decision to go into those properties without having an extraordinarily lengthy process to try to bring the property into conformance yes. with local regulation mm -hmm. because as you know because you've been involved with real estate for years a developer doesn't want to be have a long strung out period of time before they can build and they can either lose their investors or lose their financing so it's a perfect example of where we need to work together and say to you what can we do to help and it's the interest rates for the developers yeah. too it's you know yeah. These are, frankly, they're rather normal rates for what we've all dealt with. In the <laughs> That's true. I mean, like, yeah, they're still a... There for a while, right? <laughs> well, yeah, we... I don't know when you bought your house, but we, we bought ours in 81, and my interest rate was 19 and a quarter. Wow. And we were thrilled to get it. <laughs> so, and it worked. <laughs> so it's, it's, I mean, 
they're looking at what around seven, seven eight, eight now. Eight, yeah. Yeah. At, at well, a $600,000 valuation, not a no, yeah, $150,000 valuation, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But I think it's so tricky, but I still think there's ways of it being done. And I think your point is well taken that if there is um, an office building that could lend itself to some housing, um, in particular for certain some people that really need it, like our veterans and our seniors and, and our young people who want to be on their own but um, don't have a lot of money. But, um, you know, it's probably some local regulation that would allow them to do it to rezone that area for housing versus commercial or office space or whatever. Well, I think th there's a variety of ways that we can help. We can look at technical assistance for that um, through organizations like the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, um, or whether it's d direct appropriation or an earmark to help with that, um, but also uh, technical assistance to see if we can identify an inventory of those things that might uh, benefit from a rezoning or at least flexible zoning. And I, I won't get into a zoning diatribe right now, but we could look at an overlay district. Um, we could look at modifications as long as we're not spot zoning a particular building because that would run afoul of the law. But there are a lot of options that we could look at to make that happen. There are also construction challenges because a lot of office buildings are not designed uh, for the interior spaces to have windows. Okay. And, and that's a big factor for a lot of folks that would like to live in those studio apartments. And also sometimes the plumbing is not conducive <coughs> to locating bathrooms where they need to be located. So there is a cost. But that's, again, why we need to work together to confront that and incent developers to come in and build it. Because, again, right now, the, the money is in the high end of the market still. And, 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 again, what I'm hearing is at the high end, there's still a lot of sales happening and there's still a lot of, there's a lot of transactions. But, well, and I know Senator Feingold does his best too. every day <laughs> to make as many of those transactions happen <laughs> as possible. And, and we appreciate that. But, but, it, but it's, in that, it's in the lower ranges where... The margins might not be as good where we might have to work to make it more attractive. Right. And land, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. No, I was just saying land is so sparse and so expensive in Massachusetts, right? Yeah. And it's, like you said, it's cost so much to build, you know, a, you can't build a starter home and make it profitable right yeah. now. Madam Chair, there's, there's no doubt, and this is well documented, that land cost is the driving factor in Massachusetts, why housing is so much more expensive. Well, in North Andover, there's still a lot of wet land. Yeah. You know, people say, why don't we build up 114? Well, it's wet. Right. You right. can't. We've uh. preserved, right? We've yeah. preserved a lot of land as well, and I think we can have both. Um, have there been any discussions? I, I've seen some you know, ideas out there from housing advocates about directly incentivizing communities to build housing in the form of payments. Mm -hmm. Has there been discussion about that? Exactly. Yeah, 40R and 40S. Yeah, and they have—they've have, they've been around for a while, but they have not produced the kind of results that we would have hoped. Right. One one thing that's changing in the dynamic that's interesting is there used to be a tremendous fear of construction bringing new school children, but that was in the days before we had declining enrollments, and so now there's been a reversal of fortune there where. Uh, a lot of folks will look at their Chapter 70 money, which is tied directly to enrollment, and say, why is it going down or being held at a minimum? And the reason is because your enrollments are going down. So that's one fear. Some people may still have it, um, but I don't think it's as intense as it used to be. I think that was one of the biggest things that we learned um, when we went through Royal Crest is that the enrollment was going down and the, the, the buildings don't produce the enrollment that people think they do. Yeah. But it, it, the, 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 the issue that does still <laughs> pervade is, is traffic, which I think you're seeing yeah. throughout the region as well. So, um, you know, an MBTA Communities Act, I think, will go in some, address that in some ways. Yeah. But, um, I, you know, whatever we can do to improve our overall public, in, public transportation infrastructure is going to help that as well. So, huge, huge piece of the puzzle Which, and, compared and, to other major metros in the country. And, and again, Representative Wynn, I think, referenced this, but it bears repeating. Um, if there are things that are of a larger nature that might be helpful from, in terms of capital projects, it would be good to get those on a separate list because we do retain all of this information and we don't throw it out after we debate the budget. And so, for instance, when we do a transportation bond bill, it would be nice to have a wish list for that as well, if there are things that could be on it. But the caveat that we always has to, have to give is 
with a bond bill, there's no guarantee you'll ever see the money. Um, you're, you're on the playing field when we get an earmark in it, but it's up to the administration as to whether it ever gets funded. I would just say really quickly, I know that you're on um, the 114 corridor. We always talk about Shapner's Pond, too. That intersection is... That's the is other if, that, that was also part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, in our, in the initial conversation. I mean, I think from I think we're really looking at the entirety. Of, I mean, quite uh, frankly, from, right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we hear a lot about that. Yep. And there's some new buildings going in on Shopner's Pond. Right. That, um, there's some concerns there, and we've got obviously the fields there, and it becomes busy on Saturday mornings, and um, so it's become sometimes it's busier than others. But I know we hear a lot about that. So, yeah. Madam Chair, do you want to give gentlemen um, Jones a moment just to um, go through the bills that she wanted to? Highlight as well. I think that was sure. one of the reasons why we included yeah. them tonight. Yep. I don't know if she has. But uh, sometimes we're going to be asking some questions. I don't know if she has a consent list, but I didn't know if you wanted to. So the um, disability. The, I almost called you the Disability Commission. I went back in time there for a second. <laughs> By seven years. Oh my goodness. The Committee on Ability Assistance um, has recently voted to um, ask the board to support and to support themselves a few bills that I think would be helpful for them to bring to your attention. Thank you. Let me find my notes. I thought you guys would be asking the big oh, questions this time. Bear with me, please. I need to turn on a hot spot. Feels like January was three years ago. to increase substance abuse prevention and awareness and reduce over and overdose abandonment. And Bruce, Senator Tarr, I believe you're actually one of the um, petitioners of that bill. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Tarr was um, off the top of my head. Senator Tarr was signed on to probably, if we, if we put out there, let's say, 12 bills that we had asked the select board to possibly tell our delegation to support, I would guesstimate he was on roughly three quarters of those already. It's like bingo. So we have an act relative to fetal opioid drug exposure. I think yes. That's one of yours. Yep. Uh, and then there was the act establishing the Workforce Recovery Commission, yep. which um, obviously is important to us as a community. And, and in fact, if I can um, intercede, one of the things that you folks were talking about when you were asking the select board about how to bring in uh, jobs and infrastructure into the community, I know that one of the things I've constantly said to the select board, and we've had our own private conversations as well about, is the fact that there are so many people who fall under the umbrella of disability who need that assistance in finding that job who want that job, even that minimum wage job that the college kids can't fill anymore because they're back at school or, um, you know, it's just not something that, that the working parents want because it's just not the right hours. And anything we can do to put forward legislation to help those people who want those jobs, they want to work. There are nonprofit shadow programs out there that can help them provide those skills so that the small, especially the small employer, I'm not talking about the large factory down the street, I'm talking about the mom and pa store, to use old, old school terms, um, who wants to get these workers in there. They don't have to be afraid, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't have to be afraid that all of a sudden now they're $15 or $15.25 an hour, whatever minimum wage is right now, job is now going to cost them $30 an hour to get somebody in there who wants to work, even if it's 10, 15 hours a week, because they just want to feel good about themselves, as opposed to just sitting in a room somewhere collecting a, a stipend. That, that these are you know people they want to work. Let's help them work. I actually had a bill on that, and I'm, I'm now partnering with uh, Representative Gogoli on that sort of workforce development, but we've been supporting um, clubhouses as well as they're doing training for uh, people with disabilities. 
and and that is that's a huge thing we've um, we've seen. One of the other bills um, off the top of my head, uh, we had spoken about. There was a, an internet um, access bill. Yeah, there was the. I'm going to go in order, just so I don't get. Yes, off. please. There was an act relative to the mental health of children in schools, and that was the one that allowed for. Um, you could get a doctor from a note from a doctor, a mental health doctor, to have a sick day, as you would with um, any type of other illness. Uh, there was an act providing protections against predatory garden guardianship. There was an act relative to the well-being of new mothers and infants, which we fell, do, yeah. yeah, which fell right in line with um, we recently had on our show um, Jamie from. Uh, Maternal, um, maternal mental health matters, um, which fell in line with that. We've seen uh, all too recently, unfortunately, an uptick in uh, old school term again, postpartum depression, and what happens to moms after postpartum, um, which is only something that unfortunately a woman who's gone through birth truly understands one way or the other. And, and what goes on with that person's body and that sometimes somebody is driven to do something that they would never do if they thought otherwise. And that's why we need to make sure that those people receive those protections so that the devastating effects don't take place. The next one is one of Rep Wins. It's an act relative to authorizing support decision-making agreements for certain adults with disabilities. And then an act relative to authorizing supported decision-making agreements for certain adult disabilities. And I put them all into a Google Drive. I'm glad you can, because I, I, so I can. Can you send these to us? I can. I can, absolutely. Um, and then an act to modernize funding for community media programming. Which That's we, that, that was the one that, did you already speak to the delegation on that, Melissa? I haven't, no, but I know Brian Fraser has done letters of support for it. Okay, yeah. um, yes. and one of, the, one of the things that um, we as a commission were also concerned about with the internet and media was, great, you want to make sure everybody has access. That's fantastic, um, you know, but what speed do you have at home versus what speed, you know, will this act cover? You know, I, I pay a lot of money to have multi-gig speed at my house so that my two teenagers, my husband and I, can all be on the TV in four separate rooms at the same exact time um, while all being on our telephones and, and everything else that, that pulls Wi-Fi. But if you're going to make sure that somebody has Internet because of the fact that they have disability or low income or what have you, are they going to have the sustainable internet to be able to utilize for if they need the homeschooling, if they need to work from home, just being able to watch TV, are they going to have that level of internet that is now needed today or are they going to have the equivalent of dial-up when the rest of us are on a 4G network? And last but certainly not least, because close to our hearts, is the REACT to rename the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission Massability. Yes. yes. So that's the last one. Yes. That, that one we'd love to make sure Absolutely. that you folks support because that helps bring the, the Commonwealth in line with what North Andover has been doing for the past seven years. Yes. So I'll send these along to all of you so you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I do just want to take a moment and, and thank the Council on Aging for presenting me with my card to get into the Senior Center when I turned 60. And I understand Senator Feingold interrupted the Senate session to give me a birthday card, which is very much appreciated. But the council. So what are we now, Senator? Did you just have a birthday? I think we should move into executive session. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, but the, the Council on Aging sent me my card, so now when I go for office hours or anything else, it can help increase funding because I'll count as part of the census. So. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Drive safely. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to new business and we're going to confirm our town manager's appointment of Dennis Kohane. Kohane. 
as our new finance director. You're going to so. watch me get nerdy excited again. Yes. Um, but I'm very excited to welcome Dennis to Sudbury, from Sudbury. Dennis, you can come join us. us if you'd like. Um, so I worked with, had the pleasure of working with Dennis in Sudbury. He's been there since I've been gone, um, since 2016. And um, before that, he actually worked at Powers & Sullivan, which did our audit and still does our audit today. Um, and he actually worked very closely with our new accountant, who just started on Monday. Um, and so they're being reunited, he and I are being reunited, um, and so it's very exciting. And while we are losing so much um, knowledge and um, just a wonderful person in Lynn, it's good to know that we have a team in place when that will happen. So Dennis will actually be joining us until July, uh, but this will give him the opportunity to make sure everything is good and clean and set up in his current community before he comes here. Excellent. So we're very excited. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Now we need to take a vote. Please. <laughs> so I will I will move. I want to make sure that I get this right because it's okay. so confirm the town manager's appointment of Dennis Cohane as finance director. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or comments? No? All those in favor? Hi. Hi. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you very much. <laughs> so excited to see you in six months. You're welcome to go home now. So you're welcome to still attend. So. All right, we'll move on to our next item, which is to adopt the town, town manager's recommended fiscal year 2025 operating budget. All right, as you know, we have um, presented the budget to you. We are presenting to the Finance Committee on Thursday, um, which is exciting. Um, there might be a couple of small changes as we move forward. There's a, a little bit of um, flexing that we're doing with that million dollars of debt holdover. Um, we originally were going to use the ABCC, but now I think we're going to um, perhaps put towards RecPlex or something else. Um, but right now, we're kind of keeping things where they are. Um, I don't think there was a lot of questions when we did the presentation last week. I know that the schools aren't presenting to the Finance Committee until the 11th. Um, so, you know, we'll. We'll see that kind of move along, um, but I don't anticipate that we'll have any major issues or changes. But the schools have accepted, the school committee has accepted the their budget. The committee has accepted their budget, yes. Yeah. Yeah, good job. And, you know, it may go quick tonight, but we've reviewed it multiple yes. times, yeah. so it's yeah. not like this is the first time we're seeing it. We had a full presentation with all the department heads here, and yeah. uh, you've had the book for a couple of weeks. and. Kudos to Lynn for moving us over to this um, digital budget book. I think some of us have struggled because, you know, I love paper. Um, but it is really easy to find as much things. as me too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for people at home, I mean, if people want to go on and just take a look at the budget, it's all right there in mm -hmm. clear view. It's very clear easy to It's search. really it's easy if you want to just go it and check it out. That's and even the charts and being able to do comparisons to past years, yeah. it, it's actually a pretty amazing tool. Um, so we're trying to move over to doing our strategic planning on there too, um, and hopefully that will come in in the next year or so. But um, it really has, it's very transparent, and I think we're all been learning stuff from it as we move forward. So it's been great. All right. With that, I'll take a motion. Madam Chair, I'll move the select board approve and adopt the town manager's recommended fiscal year 2025 operating budget as presented. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> Big one this year, but yeah. it's good. Uh, then we'll move on to signing the warrant for the local election. Just a matter of so regular having, business. Yep. Yeah, we're going to we have are having an election. Yep. March 26th. Yep. Um, I'll take a motion. Move the select board sign the war for the local election on March 26, 2024. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We have a warrant for our local election. You know, we'll just One. remind people that um, there is in-person early voting happening right now for the presidential primary. Um, so if you're coming in now to vote, you won't be voting on this warrant. Right. You'll be voting for vote. the presidential right. primary. Yep. That's but good that you said that because yes, people are like, confusing. There's a lot of elections this year. Yeah, they're very close and it's a lot. And I think, you know, if you submitted your form back saying that you wanted ballots mailed to you for all those elections, you will get them all. But if not, you do need to come and, and do oh, it. Person? Yes, every time. <laughs> so. But early voting is set up downstairs in the hallway. and It is. So we'll be open. Very easy. Um, a big sign at the door. Huge mm -hmm. sign. Yep. And we're open um, tomorrow. 
from 8 to 4.30, Thursday from 8 to 4.30, and Friday from 8 to noon. Uh, we were open on Saturday all day, too. Um, and that's for the presidential primary. And that's March 5th, right? Mm -hmm. All right, our next item is licensing. It's a big one for licensing. <laughs> so I'll take a motion. Move we go into licensing. I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairman. We are now in licensing. Uh, and our first agenda item is a public hearing uh, on to hear public comments on the application of Trombley Brothers Incorporated for a Class Two license at 141 Sutton Street. And I'll take a motion. Chair, I'll move to open a public hearing for the application of Trombley Rose Inc. for a Class II license at 141 Sutton Street. A second. We have a motion and a second. All, the, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are now in a public hearing. Um, Ms. Trombley, well, do we have any public comment on the hearing? No. We'll go on up. Yes. How's everybody doing tonight? Okay. Good. Good. Uh, thank you all very much for having us part of the agenda tonight. Um, I usually talk too much, so I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet, <laughs> but I don't know if you guys have any questions, but ultimately what we're trying to do uh, down at Trombley's is just add another piece to the puzzle, um, offer the community, offer our, you know, we're a generational business, so we have from great-grandparents to grandchildren, um, <laughs> you know, opportunities for everyone, so we deal with a lot of uh, clients and customers, you know, from Edgewood and they have their families and a lot of them aren't actually from town which you guys know probably already and so when they find a company that they like to work with they get that trust the relationship and they kind of take that burden and say okay Trombley's here's this is what you can do for us and um, the service that we offer is that we give the opportunity that when they do decide that they're willing to let up their independency, because that's more so giving up a car is the independency at that age, they have really nice vehicles at Edgewood, and um, they take care of them very well. You know, even during when COVID was happening and stuff, I still had Mrs. Smith and, and all these other people coming down that would still want their oil changes and keep up on the car maintenance, even though they weren't really using them. So they were a huge benefit to us, um, and this is the way we were giving service back. So. Then we also have, like I said, through the generations, we have the kids coming up from high school that a lot of us, you know, the family members are a part of, and they're looking for that car that's five, six, seven thousand dollars, and they're not out there because we're all keeping them because we don't want to buy a car. Um, I know when the senators in the House was, the representatives were talking, you know, it's kind of funny tonight that they mentioned that we're trying to find reasons to create you know, sales tax and stuff like that. And I kind of chuckled when they said selling of cars um, because it is a part of it. And in the community, you're trying to find the opportunity, but also give the comfort at the same time. So that's really what we're looking to do. I'm not looking to go and sell cars, like go to auctions and stuff. I, I don't have the time, to be honest with you. Um, it's more recently we've seen an uptick in it that a lot of families are trying to decide financially, you know, do we want to pay for the insurance for our car? Do we want to do these things? And we have this beautiful car here. Some will give it to their family members, but others are, what's our opportunity? And then, like I said, a lot of parents are not wanting to buy a car uh, or they can't afford the new car for their child, but they want a safe, dependable car. So we're kind of like the middleman for that opportunity. So that's pretty much the gist of it. That's what we're doing. Um, Property-wise, we feel that we didn't want to go extreme and we're not looking to make a used car a lot uh, when, in regards to um, not having all the signs, cars, uh, the flailing arms. That's not what we're looking to do. We love that corner. That corner is one of the main corners coming into our town. Um, we take pride in it. Our family has for four generations. So we want to keep that look. Um, we have a lot of customers' cars that, when they're finished, get parked there. And it gives a great opportunity because there is so much traffic going to 495 or coming into our town. So we feel that we're not utilizing that space as efficiently um, and business-wise, financially, that we could. Um, and a lot of times, with the relationships we have with other very good used car dealers in the town, we're pretty much passing the business off to them to say, could you do this for us? And we have a great working relationship with them. They're the ones that actually kind of told us to do it. Um, so that's a benefit. 
and the way the other businesses are working is they feel that because we all work together so well, I mean, having the automotive repair, having the towing, that's obviously a benefit, um, where we do all the towing for mostly almost every repair shop in North Andover. And normally it'd be like competition, they don't work good, good, good together normally, <coughs> um, but with this community, we do. We, there's things that I can do for them and things that they can do for me, ultimately giving our customers the best benefit. So that's pretty much what we're trying to do. I don't know if I hit any logistical terms, but I was more so just wanting to give you the reasoning behind why we're doing this, why we're doing this now. We're seeing an uptick of the need for it um, because there are a lot of people that did keep their older cars, even 10, 14 year old cars that you're not gonna see at the dealerships. They're not gonna be their liability to those people that are trying to sell them. But when you have somebody that's worked on that 10 or 14 year old car, gives that opportunity to the people that are your customers saying, I've trusted this family to do this service for us for so long and I want to then potentially buy a car from them that they've serviced for that time period, that I have the history records of that car versus getting one maybe from an auction or something like that. So I don't know if that covers it, but that's what I got. Covers it pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, so you're looking to get, ten, I'm sorry, uh -huh. 10 cars, right? 10 cars, yeah. yeah. Not I saw lucky. this on the agenda. I thought, oh, I want to put a plug in for the kinds of cars that would be appropriate for a 16 year old kid. I'm just saying. Yep. Totally get it. So, yes, I think yeah. there is a need. Yeah. And we appreciate you seeing that. And, yeah. No, I appreciate We appreciate you guys in the community and expanding and seeing the need Thank in the you. community. And I just want to comment also that it is noticed by all of us how amazingly good Trombley's is mm -hmm. to the entire community yep. all of the time no matter what we ask you to do so yep. we appreciate you. that you deserve recognition for that I mean that's part of what makes it such a great community to live yep. in so thank you thank and you for the kind words and, and we, we love, see it. we love what you do for the parade and everything <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and we see it at national night out yeah we, it's every yeah. all the time <laughs> the family has kept to their roots and the traditions they came from here, and we just continue going with them and trying to make them bigger and hopefully better. We appreciate all of you. Well, well thank you for the kind words. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Move we close the public hearing. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are out of the public hearing, uh, and I'll take a motion on the application. Mr. Oh. Chair. Oh, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I'll move that the select board act as acting as licensing commissioners approve the application from Trombley Brothers Inc. for a class two license at 141 Sutton Street. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Ms. Brooke, congratulations. Thank Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, item C, we have an application from Frank Parzich of Bert Burton's Grill and Bar in North Hanover LLC for a change of hours. Thank you. Thank you. Stepping in, my name is Brian Whalen. I'm the general manager of the location North Andover. Basically, we're looking to expand into brunch. So we're looking to change our office operation on Saturday and Sunday to 10.30 as opposed to 11.30. Great idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, sounds good. What's going to be on the menu? A whole bunch of different things. <laughs> you know how they are. <laughs> they come up with something. They, they always have good, good stuff over there. there. Yeah. All right. Perfect. We'll Great come idea. try it out. <laughs> Any further questions? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. And I'll oh, second let me, it. Let me be, I guess I should be more, more official than that. Uh, move that the select board acting as license commission has approved the application from Burton's Grill and Bar of North End of LLC for a change of hours. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 You're approved. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Look How did you to... like your civics lesson this evening? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moving right along, we have an application from 350 Winthrop Ave LLC and Kamal Simon of Lonnie's Roast Beef and Pizza for a common victory license at 350 Winthrop Ave. Good evening, everybody. So I just, I'm in a food business since I came to this country, and this is my fourth restaurant, and I'm trying to serve the North End of our city. So, I request you guys to give us a chance. 
Do you have other pizza joints? Or I have a. This is my fourth one. I have fourth a three, pizza. Uh, basically, I'm from New Hampshire, Manchester. Mm -hmm. The first one I had over there. So I have one second one I have in the New Bedford, Mass. Oh. In Dorchester, and this is. Oh wow! It's spread out. Yeah. It's family, <laughs> spread out. family owns other. 17, 18. So. Okay. In the mid one, we have a look. Giovanni's, uh, Hebrew, Giovanni's, means around here we have Lawrence, we have a Nix. It's everybody's in the same business. So do you intend to keep the menu pretty much the same? It's, we keep the same. When some things are not broken, you don't have to fix it. You know, it's, just it's not broken there, yeah. yeah so <laughs> <laughs> I hear it's not broken there. Yeah, yeah we hear it's very good. I'll take a motion. I'll move that the select board, acting as licensing commissioners, approve the application uh, from 350 Winthrop Ave LLC and Kamal Sani of Londi's Roast Beef and Pizza for a common victor license at 350 Winthrop Ave. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, last uh, item E. We have an application from Camila Costa, Divine Sugar Cakes Incorporated, for a common license at 1820 Turnpike Street. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for spacing your agenda. And thank you for your patience. Thank <laughs> you. So, my name is Camila. We have a Brazilian bakery just to open last week. And we, we believe if you can have the the chairs for the customers. You have a nice space for the family. I don't know if someone could check, but yes, just it is. We work in, in desserts, pastries, everything Brazilian. Facebook wow. seems to love you so far, so oh, <laughs> we'll have to will go check it out. Will you serve coffee? By yes, All we right. have <laughs> coffee, and tea, hot chocolate. I don't know, I mean, you're located next to the candy dish, so this is really <laughs> <laughs> getting to be <laughs> yeah, it's convenient. a problem yes. area. <laughs> you walk up to the dance mom upstairs. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, I ride home. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I've heard of. Very yeah, good. Very videos. good. Thanks. Good. So excited to check it out. Okay. And Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Good luck. Congratulations. We'll be back. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> uh, that is it for licensing. I'll take a motion. I'll move to close the meeting of the North Andover Licensing Commission. I'll second that. A motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Back to you. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So we're off to our consent items. We have a donation in the amount of $100 from Beth, Olivia, and Maya Hurley to the library for the purchase of books. I'll take a motion. I'll move that the select board accept the donation in the amount of $100 from Beth Oliva and Maya Hurley to the library for the purchase of books. I'll second that. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much for your donation. The library very much appreciates it. Um, and we'll move on to the approval of our minutes from February 7th and January 22nd. Has everybody had a chance to review them? Thank you for the corrections. Yeah. Agreed. That was great. Appreciate that. Uh, I'll take a motion. I'll move the select board approve the minutes of February 7th, 2024 and January 22nd, 2024 as presented. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Do we have any select board updates? I could give a quick website update. We are in the uh, in the throes of it. The design is pretty close to, to locked in at this point, some minor tweaks, but now they're in the process of migrating data and loading up photos and all stuff. So we'll be able to give her a little test drive soon enough, but it won't be until after town meeting that we'll be able to, to publicly. No point in confusing everyone before we got to <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> uh, the war item. So, but it's moving along. Uh, the whole team's been great. So. Good. All right, we'll move on to the town manager's report. I already told okay. you what we're going to do. That's what I was going to say. We are. <laughs> 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 Hazardous yeah, waste day is April 20th from yeah. 9 to 1, just so people know that. Um, what? what did you say? Hazardous okay. waste day. It's at DPW. It's at DPW. I know that's a, a big one for everybody. You said April 20th? It's mm -hmm. April 20th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, the spring leaf, I know it's coming, spring is coming, and we're going <laughs> to believe it today. Um, we're going to have our spring leaf bag curbside pickup, so it's the weeks of the 
April 8th, 15th, and 22nd. Um, and so we're encouraging people to get their leaves out during those weeks. Um, I want to congratulate our town clerk, Don Warren, and our select person, Jan Phillips, who both have been selected for the tribute to women from the YWCA. Yeah. Very exciting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We just found Great. that out, I think, yesterday. Yeah. 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 We don't know who the other um, people are yet, but I think it's going to be a very exciting event. So and I think it is May 16th. Um, so we're looking forward to honoring both of them. Thank you. In trash recycling, have been relatively quiet. I Other than agreed. the day of delay, which was very hard. Other than Representative Ramos, recycling still hasn't been picked up. Oh boy, <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks. Early today. Early. So we've, we've, it's been a little. It's been quiet. It's been better for yeah, sure. I, right? I feel like I need to knock on everything, yes. but we're doing okay. So um, I think they should not change what they're doing yeah, right now. Yeah. <laughs> they got a plan. Stick to, stick to oh, the plan. Uh, Reminder that the warrant does close on March 11th at 4:30 p.m which is your next, the same day as your next mm -hmm. meeting. All right. Thank you. So our next meeting is March 11th at 7 p.m. I kind of ruined that. <laughs> Surprise. 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 Oh, all right, then. <laughs> anybody was waiting on the end of their seat. Uh, are we 7 p.m. or are we 6 p.m.? We have executive session? We're going to have an executive session. Okay. Yes, right. yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then public open meetings at 7. Um, and that's it. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.